So I am absolutely delighted to, to help kick off uh, this event. And what I am charged to do here is to give some 30,000 foot uh, views of what we're seeking to accomplish here. So speaking of 30,000 feet or higher, let's talk about our planet, our amazing planet that is so fluid in both the atmosphere, as in this example from NASA Goddard and Oregon State University, showing how the Earth essentially has lungs, breathing in and out every season with carbon dioxide levels that are shown in the reds and the oranges. And of course, the planet is uh, fluid in terms of the ocean. So this is another NASA Goddard visualization showing tens of thousands of ocean currents as derived from satellite measurements of sea surface height and gravity and wind stress and sea surface temperature. So we are on indeed a fluid planet. And the fluidity of this planet is in fact our future. It is essentially what gives it life. And yet, as we know, it's being increasingly challenged. In fact, we find the timing of this form to be at the nexus of a perfect storm, if you will. Because here in the US, we were challenged just last week by a bomb cyclone, cyclone on each coast. And here on the west coast, we were hit just last week by a major atmospheric river. And for those who attended our forum last year, recall Sasha Gershinov's keynote on that important subject. As an example, Sacramento last week experienced its wettest day on record with a maximum of 10.4 inches of rain in Blue Canyon. And this came shortly after its longest consecutive dry spell on record, all in the midst of a record-breaking drought. So we know that conditions like this are a sign of things to come as climate change continues to progress. Now, 2021, this is one of the most important years ever in terms of global policy agendas. As you know, we're currently in the middle of the UN Climate Change Conference known as COP26 from Glasgow, Scotland. There's also COP15 about biological diversity there is the launch this year of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and the launch of the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. These all bring a new set of challenges and opportunities for both the international earth observing and scientific communities as well as the international GIS community of which we are a part. And our enduring hope for COP26 is that it will accelerate action not just words, but action towards the goals of the Paris Agreement and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. For instance, we may have some traction on slashing methane emissions worldwide. Methane has 34 times the warming potential of CO2 over a 100 year period and 72 times the warming potential over a 20 year period. It was also announced this week at COP26 by the National Geographic Pristine Seas Program that Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Panama have just created a new marine protected area called the Eastern Tropical Pacific Marine Corridor. Now with regard to ESRI, uh, it's our ESRI UK distributor that is taking the lead in terms of ESRI's participation at COP26. For example, they have a knowledge transfer network virtual pavilion over the entire duration of the event, focusing on sustainable transportation and infrastructure, environment and energy. There are great use cases and story maps being shared all week from peat bog restoration and sustainable farming in Ireland to the development of better walking and cycling routes in London to the work of the Scottish government in fighting coastal erosion. And the UK Met Office also has a pavilion showcasing among many things their use of ESRI technology to make their predictive climate data more accessible and easier to use by climate policymakers. We're also very proud to announce a new microsite that you can access from ESRI.com on climate action planning. And there are very important sections on this site about evaluating impact, assessing risks, mitigating and adapting, and of course, taking action. 
And this is big kudos to Pat Cummins, Noel Lofren, and uh, many others on our industry solutions team for making this site possible. And you should know also that Pat Cummins, along with Steve Cope, uh, are leaders of our uh, cross-sector uh, community of practice, if you will, in terms of climate change within uh, ESRI. And ESRI UK has made their own UK version of this site for use at COP26 this week. All of the messaging on this site and all of the messaging uh, this week from us at COP26 is about how the geographic approach through GIS can be used to effectively fight the climate crisis. And what we're calling the geographic approach is simply a holistic way of thinking and problem solving that integrates geographic science and information into how we understand and manage our planet. For instance, the experts attending the Geospatial World Forum in Amsterdam just prior to COP26 unanimously agreed that the use of the geographic approach to tackle the biggest threat to humanity, which is climate change, is more of a necessity now than a choice. That's because geospatial not only provides visual proof of extreme weather conditions, such as melting polar ice caps and dying corals, vanishing islands, but it links that visual proof to all kinds of physical, biological, and socioeconomic data in a way that helps us to understand what was, what is, and what could be. Indeed, seeing is believing. And on why seeing is truly believing, the esteemed climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe, who is a friend of ours at Esri as well, writes in her new book, Saving Us, that climate change isn't a future issue, it is here and now for all of us. And when we're able to see its impacts with our own eyes and understand what we're looking at, this experience can breach many of the emotional and political frames we've built up in our minds. Indeed, GIS does help us to understand what we're looking at. Your work helps us to understand. And while the politics of climate change continues, we as members of the GIS community need to stay in the trenches working to increase the access to and the democratization of data of our workflows, our apps, our hubs, and more to ensure that everyone has the right tools required to deal with the clim changing climate and to prevent long-term damage. There really is no alternative now. We have to be, uh, as Jack Dangerman says, all in. Speaking of access to technology, I'm pleased to announce the availability of a new flipbook. This is free at the web address at the upper right. And this flipbook is made up of the technology showcase vignettes from all three volumes of the GIS for Science book series. So this collection shares the innovations and contributions of Esri's own staff to science. And many of these contributions are also published in the peer reviewed scientific literature. Among these contributions uh, are a new hexagonal tessellation or gridded mesh and bivariate symbology of drought intensity and duration in the US. A new interpolation technique of ocean weather or climate variables by way of the 3D empirical Bayesian Krieging invented here at Esri. Our support of the national water model with our workflows and interactive 3D web apps and models that are further enhanced with estimates of damage costs to people, property, and infrastructure, thanks to Esri's Geo Enrichment Service. Everyone's favorite, the Spielhaus One Ocean Projected Coordinate System that's available in both ArcMap and ArcGIS Pro. Thanks to the mathematical and cartographic wizardry of Esri staff, who made the necessary translations of the original work of Spielhaus in the 1970s to a modern 21st century GIS architecture. Our space time cubes and trend analysis and data clocks for more fully quantifying and understanding phenomena such as red tides. Our generate trend raster tool for integrating statistical regression methods into a multidimensional raster data model, especially for analyzing time series data. 
our processing workflow to produce a layer of 30-year monthly average precipitation in the Living Atlas. This is derived from NOAA's Global Historical Climatology Network Daily Archive, otherwise known as GHCN-D, along with climographs for the weather stations around the world producing these data. Our beautiful U.S. Vessel Traffic web app for analyzing spatial and temporal patterns and trends for cargo vessels, fishing vessels, military vessels, passenger, tanker vessels, and more, all with stunning cartography. An analysis workflow for more efficient overlay and mapping of the frequency or predominance of millions of weather advisories, watches, and warnings from the National Weather Service, as we'll hear from, from Mary. A new GIS workflow developed in collaboration with GeoBlue Planet and the United Nations Environment Program to identify and quantify the number and severity of eutrophication events in nearshore waters to support the reporting requirements of the UN SDG 14.1 target. And voxels, 3D elements, 3D volume elements, finally in ArcGIS and used here in one of my favorite parts of the world to reveal the structure and symmetry of different types of underwater volcanic eruptions. So again, these are all from volumes one to three of GIS for Science, uh, and you can get the digital resources that accompany all these vignettes and more from GISforscience.com. And volume three, which is uh, just came out last month, has a new subtitle to it, Maps for Saving the Planet, because this is the year of biodiversity with most of the chapters focusing uh, on that issue. And yes, the planet will still be here regardless, but to our way of thinking, saving the planet, including our atmosphere and ocean, most specifically our atmosphere and ocean, means keeping it healthy for all the species that still live on it, above it, and within it. So to us, saving the planet actually means saving the species and thereby saving us. Now the father of biodiversity, uh, E.O. Wilson, who wrote the foreword to Maps for Saving the Planet, has said repeatedly, we only have a short time to decide our future. We are in a race to save our living environment. So we do need to take this personally to have a chance at reversing current trends. So we very much appreciate all of you taking this personally and being here with us at this forum to share and communicate your work you are opening the eyes of others to really understanding the urgency of what we must do to create knowledge and sustainable solutions with our world in such peril. And again, seeing is believing and doing. It's late in the day, as many have said, but it's not dark yet. E.O. Wilson in his lifetime, and he's 92 years old now, has witnessed a terrible decline but as, but as his friend uh, David Attenborough told the COP26 assembly, our lifetime could and should witness a wonderful recovery. So here's to that. Here's to all of you and your fantastic work. And we thank you again for attending. If you would like a copy of these slides and some additional notes, you can go to esriurl.com slash OWC2021. And also, uh, please visit our map gallery at the address underneath the goesri.com owc-map-gallery to see uh, the wonderful maps that have been submitted specifically for this forum. There are seven of them, uh, as well as some additional maps. And the seven attendees who have submitted their, their maps to the map gallery will receive a free copy of the new GIS for Science uh, Volume 3 book. So thank you again very much for, for listening. Thank you, uh, Lorraine, and my thanks in advance to, to Mary.